The manhua starts with a girl who is introduced to a mysterious man. The girl's father states to her that he should be taught a lesson. The girl replies, Our little toy's got quite the rebellious look in its eyes, father. We then learn that one of the girl's friends from school recommended a tragic romance novel called The Abysmal Flower. In the beginning, the girl could barely read a single sentence because the book was about how Sylvia, the female protagonist, gets herself involved in kidnapping, incarceration, and erotic relationships. It was the ultimate X-rated orgy romance novel. In the story, there were five families that ruled the world, which were the Black Agritza, the Blue Pedalion, the Gold Verdium, the White Fidelion, and the Red Castro. Sylvia, the female protagonist, was a blue pedalion, which are also known as the arch enemies of the Black Agresh. Sylvia had mystical silver blue hair and golden eyes that shined as brightly as the sun. She was, to put it simply, lovely. But tragedy struck when the heir of the family, her only brother, who had faithfully been carrying out pedalion family duties from an early age named Cassus Pedalion, went missing. We are, then, back in the present. As the girl's father grabs the mysterious man from his hair and tells his guards to lock him up in the dungeon until he breaks, we learn that the man responsible was none other than the Pedelian's arch enemy, the head of the Black Agress family, who is named Lante Agreche. He is the girl's godforsaken father. As for the boy who was just dragged away by the guards, he was Cassus Pedelian. We then switch to the next scene, where we see the girl heading down the dungeon with a lantern. Once she makes it to the entrance of the dungeon, she asks the guard if she can borrow his eyes for a second. The guard starts to blush and denies the girl. He also adds that he was strictly ordered not to let anyone in. However, the girl interrupts the guard and mentions to them that she never said anything about going in. She further questions him about if he's guarding something precious, like a handsome, silver-haired boy. The guard flinches upon hearing this question. The girl then uses her charm on the guard and states that she just wanted the keys. She also asks him if she may have them or not. The guard eventually gives in and hands the keys to the girl. The girl thinks that the guard is an idiot. As she starts to open the door, the guard yells at the girl as she just told him that she just wanted the keys. He adds that she'll get him killed. The girl tells the guard that she changed her mind. She adds that she won't take too long and how no one will even notice. She further mentions to the guard that her father doesn't need to know about this either. As she starts walking inside, the guard shouts out, no! The girl then starts to look for Kasish in the dungeon. Eventually, she finds him and states to herself that at this rate, she's already off to a bad start. We then see Kasish inside the dungeon. He is very bloody and chained up. After noticing Kasish's condition, the girl decides that she should save him as she's aware that he's her only means of survival. We then start to learn more about the Agris family. The Agris family tradition is a banquet which is all about power dynamics. We also learn that Lante Agris had more than 10 wives and consequently had many, many children. Only the three most accomplished children were allowed to join their father at the banquet table every month. Never did that banquet table have a seat for the girl. However, that was only when she was a child. Everything had changed after a certain incident. When the girl was first born, the very first voice she ever heard was warm and gentle, which was her mother's. Her mother had honey blonde hair that shimmered like gold and deep blue eyes that reminded her of a vast lake. Even then, the girl was into people's looks. She was infatuated by her mother's beauty and believed that her father was one lucky guy. She was also very satisfied with her reincarnation. However, the day that the girl first saw her father, 
he only spared only a moment to name her. He named her Roxana and left. The girl thought that her father was crappy. Still, her mother would always smile at her. Roxana's mother wished for Roxana to grow big and strong and make House Agrees proud. Upon Roxana hearing the Agrees house name from her mother's mouth, she realized that this is the family that she belongs to. She knew from her previous life that this family is known for drugs and poison, fraud, theft, and even murder. She was also aware that her family could kill without batting an eye and how her family were criminals, rules of the seedy underground world. Roxana thought that the worst thing about her being born in this family is that she had to follow the same path as this is how the Agrisis have carried on their family legacy. Roxana knew that to become a true Agris, all family members have to go through training from an early age. Roxana was no exception. She didn't mind the studying, but she had no talent in practical skills. Even her father looked down on her. Roxana thought that her father was such a despicable person. She never wanted to work for him. She also hated how her father treated her like she's some kind of object. We further learn about Roxana's older brother named Achille Agress. He's four years older than Roxana and they share the same mother. Unlike everyone else in the family, Achille is a big softy, a bit like an innocent puppy. In the past, Achille stated to Roxana that she seems upset and asked her if something's wrong. Roxana told her brother that their father wants her to begin preparing for courtship already. Achille was shocked to hear this statement. Roxana questioned her brother about what he thinks of this as she has no interest in learning that at all. Achille asked her if their mother knows. Roxana replied, of course, she expects me to become a proud agresh. Upon hearing this response, Achille agreed, and as he patted his sister, he explained to her that they're agrisis after all and how she shouldn't worry. He added that he'll always protect her. Roxana wonders why back then. She didn't notice her brother's hands trembling. Their family legacy was an irksome burden for both of them. They were barely getting by when the incident occurred. Suddenly, we see another past memory of Roxana's where Achille is on the ground and is really bloody. His mother shouted out his name and Roxana was trembling and shivering in fear. At that moment, Roxana knew that Achille didn't make it through the special test and ended up dying at an early age. We are then back in the present. Roxana is inside Cassis's prison cell and calls out to him. However, he doesn't answer. This makes Roxana realize that her family must have used something to paralyze Cassis. She then takes out an antidote and puts it inside his mouth. She also makes Cassis gulp the antidote down, which makes him come to his senses. Once he is conscious, he starts to move around and asks Roxana what's going on. As Roxana covers his mouth, she responds, be quiet, don't spit it out, it's an antidote. Believe it or not, I'm here to save you. Roxana knew that Cassus is the heroine's big brother in this story, but she also believes that her survival depends on his. Roxana then questions Cassis if he understands. Cassis doesn't reply and instead starts to move around even more. This causes the chains to make clank and clink sounds. Roxana knows that he's just been kidnapped by his family's sworn enemy. So, she doesn't expect him to believe her right away. As she clenches her fist, she decides that she can't just wait around all day for the antidote to kick in. Suddenly, Roxana punches Cassis in the stomach. Cassis droops down onto her shoulder and becomes unconscious. Roxana sighs and then apologizes to Cassis. We then see the next scene where Roxana is returning to the dungeon to see Cassis. Once she makes it to Cassis's prison cell, she notices that he's awake. This makes her realize that he's a Padelian for a reason as she didn't expect him to regain consciousness so quickly. She further thinks that she shouldn't underestimate him. 
Cassis then calls out to Roxana and asks her what did she make him swallow. Roxana replies, an antidote. You were drugged, remember? You'd still be in extreme pain if I hadn't given you anything. Don't you feel better? See how you're able to talk normally now? Cassis chuckles and questions her that if what she's saying is really true, then why did she give it to him and what does she want from him? Roxana mentions to him that she wants nothing. She further confirms with him if his name is Cassis Pedelian. Cassis grits his teeth and shouts that she should stop playing dumb with him. He adds that she dragged him here knowing full well who he was. He further asks her who she is and if she's one of those filthy agreesies. This question makes Roxana realize that he knows here he is and how her father had no intention of hiding anything. As Cassis glares at Roxana, he shouts at her to answer him now. Roxana then tells him that she knew it. She also confirms with him if he can't see right now. Roxana believes that she's right, that Cassis can't see a thing. She tests his sight by waving her fingers in front of him and questioning him about how many fingers she has up. Instead of replying to her question, Cassis shouts at her to get lost. Roxana grins upon hearing this and states that she thought it was odd that he didn't realize who she was. Roxana had a feeling that he couldn't see since he even asked if she was one of the aggressors. Roxana clearly remembers how their eyes met yesterday. She knows that there's no other explanation as to why Cassis doesn't recognize her today. All of a sudden, Roxana lifts up Cassis's shirt and confirms her suspicion. Her suspicion was that a spell was cast on Cassis, not poison. Roxana then mentions to Cassis that it's a temporary spell and how it won't last long. She adds that she will leave his eyes like that for now. In about two days, he'll be able to see again. Roxana also grabs Cassis by the chin and mentions to him that she knows that he will never believe her, but she meant it when she said that she doesn't want him to die. As she starts to leave, she adds that she will see him tomorrow. Cassis shouts at her to wait. However, Roxana doesn't wait and slams his prison cell door shut. We then see the next day. Roxana greets Cassis and asks him how he's feeling today. Cassis shouts at her to get lost. We then see the day after that, and Roxana questions him about how the guards really roughed him up today. However, Cassis turns his head the other way and ignores her. We then switch to another day, and Roxana asks Cassis if he still believes that she's not trying to help him. Cassis flinches upon hearing this question and tells her to go away. Roxana mentions to him that she thought she should bring him something more appetizing than the garbage that they keep feeding him. Cassis states that she's so mean. Roxana then adds that she doesn't blame him for being so skeptical, but he's got to eat something eventually. Roxana further offers him a meal replacement pill. Cassis questions her if she really expects him to accept something from one of Agress's little stooges. He adds that she should get lost. As Roxana squeezes the pill in her hand, she responds, I understand where you're coming from, but this is the only way to survive. Suddenly, Roxana punches Cassis in the stomach again. This makes Cassis mad. He asks her what that was for. Roxana explains to him that he keeps refusing to eat, so she's just going to have to put him to sleep and make him eat it. Upon hearing this explanation, Cassis tells her that she's crazy. He adds that she's in a grease and questions her what does she have to gain from helping him. As Roxana shoves the pill into Cassis's mouth, she mentions that he should just eat this first. She adds that he should be able to swallow it even without water as it's dissolvable. Cassis then asks Roxana why she's helping him and what her motive is. He also questions her about what her name is. Roxana states her name to him. Upon hearing her name, Cassis thought that it was a fitting name for someone with eyes that resemble rubies. 
He also thought that they were as crimson as when the curtain of darkness is drawn and the burning sun rises, the same color as the glow of dawn. We then see the next scene where Roxana is in her room balcony. One of the maids walks inside Roxana's room. Roxana allows the maid to come inside. The maid slides a glass of water on the table. Roxana then asks her why she's here. The maid mentions to Roxana that she's at stage five natarium tolerance. She adds that they will be increasing the dose by 0.2 peron starting today. That's a lethal amount of 4.7 peron and how she may experience some stomach pain, temporary paralysis, or even cough up blood. We then learn that all agrises develop immunity against poison by gradually self-administering non-lethal amounts. Roxana has already developed immunity to most poisons, but there's a reason why she's still doing this. Roxana then asks the maid about what Jeremy is doing now as she pours the poison into her glass of water. The maid replies, he is in his room at the moment. He'll be here any second now. All of a sudden, someone bursts into Roxana's room and mentions to her that he's here to pick her up. We learn that this person is the antagonist of this story, who is also Roxana's half-brother. We then learn more about the book that Roxana read in her previous life called The Abysmal Flower. In the beginning of the story, the heroine, Sylvia, gets kidnapped by the Agrese family. There, she learns of the death of her older brother and suffers a mental breakdown. Triggered by this incident, she annihilates the entire Agrese family. The main culprit behind these unfortunate events is none other than Jeremy Agrese, who's Roxana's half-brother. Jeremy then asks Roxana when she got here and if she was checking on the poison butterflies at the greenhouse again. Roxana replies, yes, it's the last egg after all. I want to make sure I succeed this time. Jeremy starts to pout upon hearing this response and states that he doesn't want her losing any more blood. He also questions Roxana if she really has to do this. As Roxana grins, she starts thinking about how he's still such a kid. However, a quite adorable one. Jeremy then starts to walk towards Roxana and tells her that he wonders why their father won't let them anywhere near the new toy that he has brought home the other day. Roxana mentions to Jeremy that he did seem a little special. Jeremy is surprised to hear this and states that she has never shown interest in any of the toys before. Roxana agrees and tells Jeremy that this one intrigues her. Jeremy shrugs his shoulders and says, fine, I guess I'll just let you have this one then. Roxana starts to laugh. She then pats Jeremy on the head and mentions to him that he's so sweet. She also asks him if they should get going. We then see the next scene where Roxana and Jeremy sit down on the banquet table. Their father also congratulates them on all of their accomplishments this month and how they should begin the banquet. Roxana's father further states to Roxana that he noticed that she's consistently in second place. He also questions her how her poison butterfly experiment is going. Roxana responds, I've got high hopes. The first two ended in failure, but the last egg is in perfect health. I can't wait for you to see it, father. Roxana's father starts to laugh upon hearing this response and mentions to her that he knows that she won't disappoint him. Roxana states to her father that he seems to be in a good mood today. She also asks him if it's because of his new catch. Roxana's father chuckles. As he swirls his drink, he tells Roxana that she's a smart one and how she reminds him of a younger version of himself. He adds that he heard that the Padelians are busy looking for the little bastard. Upon hearing this statement, Jeremy questions his father why the Padelians are looking for him and what's the big deal about the guy. His father explains how he's the blue heir. This response surprises Jeremy and causes him to jolt out of his seat. He also confirms with his father if that's really true as he's in disbelief. 
Roxana further mentions to her father that she knew it and how he's amazing. Roxana's father twitches and states to Roxana that he didn't know she was interested in these kinds of things. Roxana chuckles and tells her father that it's because this one is not like the other toys. She adds that Pedelians are known to be virtuous and impartial. Moreover, the blue air is considered to be the most upstanding of them all. As she grins, she asks her family if it would be fun to see the most noble Pedelian beneath her feet, barking like a horny little dog. Upon hearing this question, Roxana's father starts to laugh very loudly. He then puts his glass down and says, That's not a bad idea. Let's call it a day. You're both dismissed. We then see the next scene where Jeremy whacks someone with his elbow and mentions to them to move out of the way. He also questions Roxana about if she's really going to teach that toy a lesson all by herself. As Roxana twirls her hair, she confirms that she thinks she will. Jeremy is surprised to hear this and confirms with her if she really is. This makes Roxana realize that Jeremy's worried about losing her attention and thinks that it's cute. Suddenly, someone bursts into the room and asks them what they are talking about. The person turns out to be a red-haired girl. As the red-haired girl points at Roxana, she shouts at Roxana that this isn't fair as she already called dibs on the toy. Roxana sighs and thinks that this is annoying. She then lifts her hand and apologizes to the red-haired girl. We also learn that the red-haired girl's name is Charlotte. Roxana adds that it's already been discussed with father during the banquet. Charlotte starts to shout even louder and tells Roxana that she was never interested in the toys before and how this is so unfair. She also swings something towards Roxana. However, Jeremy protects Roxana by getting in front of her. He ends up getting hit on the arm by whatever Charlotte threw at Roxana. Jeremy then questions the Charlotte about, since when did they start calling dibs on the toys? Charlotte yells back at Jeremy and tells him that he should stay out of this and how she won't let Roxana have him as he's hers. This makes Roxana remember about how Charlotte threw a tantrum because she wasn't allowed to see Cassis. Roxana thought that considering she's never really been denied anything before, it's no wonder why she's so upset. Charlotte then shouts out that she's telling father. This statement makes Roxana give Charlotte a cold look. She also asks her, since when did all toys belong to her? Roxana adds that she had the privilege of playing with the toys, but it was never a right. The reason why she was able to have them all to herself in the first place was only because she was never interested in them until now. As Roxana starts to pull out needles from her hair, she further questions Charlotte if she really thinks she'd always have everything her way. Roxana then sighs and states that she didn't expect her to be that stupid. She adds that this is foolish of her. Charlotte takes out her whip as well and halts upon hearing these statements. Roxana then smirks and says, Okay, my dear little sister, let me show you in a way you'll understand. She then smacks Charlotte with her needles. This causes Charlotte to start bleeding. As she's trembling and shaking on the ground, Jeremy asks her why did she even try. He adds that she always makes such a big deal out of everything. Jeremy further reassures Roxana that he will take her of the rest so she can go on. Roxana agrees with Jeremy and leaves. Once Roxana is gone, Jeremy grabs Charlotte by her ponytail and mentions to her that if she's going to take it out on someone, then she should do it to that bastard down in the dungeon. As Jeremy glares at Charlotte, he adds that he's already pissed off as it is because of him and how he doesn't need another reason to be mad. Jeremy further states to her that the blue-haired bastard is responsible for all of this. As Charlotte is coughing, she questions Jeremy for more clarification. Upon hearing this question, Jeremy starts to smirk 
and believes that she might actually come in handy later. He then clarifies to Charlotte that she wouldn't know, since she's never been invited to the banquet. He adds that the guy in the dungeon is Cassus Padillion, and how it's too bad that there's only one of them. Jeremy further confirms with Charlotte if she would try to destroy Cassus just because she can't have him. Charlotte starts to smirk upon hearing this question from Jeremy. Please make sure to subscribe. Special thanks to all of my Patreon members. Why not watch another manhole recap on my channel by clicking on this video right here 